Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I, I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our mini series, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. It, what a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free that's the whole back catalog plus future episodes and twice monthly there's gonna be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions so people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders and uh, you get a whole lot of more of paul america's pcp <laughs> all right paul this this part is going to be <laughs> humiliating, but yep, uh, as always, Paul, I wanted to start off with something. And uh, Dr. Fine, I apologize for this up front. But uh, <laughs> uh, Paul, you know, I I was looking at my urine the other day to see I cannot if, believe you're doing this. to see if I was if I was healthy or not. And, you know, the conclusion. No, Paul, it was unclear. <laughs> <laughs> um, two laughs, by the way, for the two, listeners at home. <laughs> th thank you. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. This is a live podcast, so welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Paul, how how are things going? Great, I'm good, nervous, um, but glad to actually be doing a live event. So nice to see everyone here. Thank you so much. And uh, Paul, would you remind it, people what is it exactly that we do on the Curbsiders? Of course, we're going to talk to our great guest, Dr. Derek Fine, about hematuria. But what is it that we generally do on this show? Sure. As a reminder, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And we have the great Dr. Derek Fine with us to talk us through some of the evaluation for hematuria. And I'll let you tell us a little bit about our, our guest today. All right. So Dr. Derek Fine, he is self-described as a Hopkins lifer. He's been there since medical school. He uh, was recently clinical director of nephrology here. He's a professor of medicine. He has a focus on HIV, kidney disease, and lupus. And, you know, without that, Paul, I think we should just jump right into this and uh, maybe get to know our guests a little bit. What do you think? Absolutely. Okay. So, Derek, first question, uh, an easy question, I think. Uh, what is a hobby that you have outside of medicine? Then we're, we're going to start, you know, ramping it up uh, after yeah. that. So, I don't have any major hobbies where I do something a lot. I would say it changes over time. My big hobby is my family. I work hard. I love my work, so it's sort of my hobby. And I get pleasure out of my work. I kind of don't feel I need a whole lot extra. But um, recently, I've... I've it, with YouTube, I've gotten into chess again. I was an avid chess player as a kid, and my son and I watch YouTube videos, and we're trying to learn some new openings. So, and we have like a, a Wednesday night call where we discuss uh, some chess games and things. So, I'd say that's become a little hobby. Not that's a lot good. of time for that's it, but a, it's fun. That's a good game. And the YouTube videos you're watching are these chess matches or tutorials or what? What, what does this entail exactly? I, yeah, I, I, I sort of thank God I, I didn't have YouTube as a teenager because I actually would have probably <laughs> just watched chess videos all day. Yeah. It's unbelievable what's out there. Um, people who are masters teaching you how to do things and uh, you know strategies, and then just watching games, the World Championship. Which is, and so it's nice to to just watch the games and have commentary at the side and the computer telling you who's going to win. And, Kind of fun. We got a chessboard for Christmas, and I made the mistake of my wife and I could beat the kids pretty handily because they had never played, <laughs> and even though I hadn't played in a long time. And then I like made the mistake of showing my sons that there's like different openings and that YouTube can teach you them. And now like oh, my yeah. ten year old can beat everybody in the house, yeah. and he's like, because he's he's very that's... tricky to begin with, and now like he found chess <laughs> is a tricky game, so that's good. Yeah. Um, Paul, anything you want to ask before we get to the case? Sure. And I'd love to ask any favorite advice or feedback that you've received or given during your career or training. I think there, there's a couple things that stand out. Um, one is my, my father always told me, you know, Derek, find something that you're passionate about and you'll become good at it. I thought that was good advice. I sometimes don't follow that and then I get in trouble. Um, and then my former chief once gave he actually gave this grand rounds paul shill and he said you know pick up the phone 
And the advice was when someone calls you, pick up the phone because you never know what's on the other side that could sort of change your life. And I think, or change a patient's life. And, and I think that's come true many times. All right. Terrific advice. So, Paul, I think let's let's get to a case because we I want to spend plenty of time on the clinical aspect of this. So why don't you read us a case from everyone's favorite hospital, which is a real place, at least in our hearts, <laughs> in uh, our Cash Lack Memorial. So our case from Cash Lack Hospital, we're going to talk about Mr. Jones. He's a 40 year old gentleman who follows with you for primary care. Um, you being us collectively. His past history is noteworthy for high blood pressure. He's on five milligrams of amlodipine. He has obesity with a body mass index of 31, has some tobacco use. You're a little bit surprised to see him since you just saw him about four months ago and your visits are mostly consist of counseling and yearly follow-up. Um, at that last visit, he noted some low back pain. So you recommended NSAIDs because that's what we do. Um, maybe we forgot to give a duration or a limitation. In any case, he shares with you that he's been seeing blood in his urine for the past two weeks and he is understandably alarmed by this. So Derek, before we get too deep into the case and how you even sort of conceptualize the workup of hematuria, I'd like to ask, um, we like to start with definitions and hopefully we can agree that hematuria is blood in the urine, but is there anything else that we should be thinking about? And I guess other, I would follow how much blood do you have to see before you even, we start to be concerned or, or so yeah, let's just start. Tell, tell us about hematuria is what I'm asking. So I think over time the definitions change, but currently most believe that three or more red cells in the urine is, is hematuria. And one time of three is enough to prompt a workup for hematuria. A gross hematuria is just visible hematuria. Yeah, I, I think microscopic hematuria is one of those banes of, if you're, well, any doctor really, gen, but usually the general internist, it's like our responsibility to follow it up. Everyone else can be like, oh yeah, we saw some hematuria. You're, tell your PCP <laughs> about it. Right. So uh, I'm I'm curious to to get your advice on this, but what else what else do we need to know about the history here? Uh, we've given you some that he's he's chewing down NSAIDs, but what else do you want to know about Mr. Jones? So so usually I start off, you know, I'm going to get the call. Can you see this patient? And then I'm going to say, I think you need to call the urologist. Okay, that, that most of the calls I get are actually urology, and and it turns out 80% or more of of the time, if there's hematuria, it's it's not a nephrology issue. Um, and I guess we'll get into when it becomes a nephrology issue and hopefully someone's already done some workup that'll say, actually, no, you need to see this patient because this is, is one of your problems, not a urologic one. So that's the way I'm sort of first looking at it. Am I dealing with something that's urologic or nephrologic? Um, if it's gross hematuria, it's always pretty serious and much more likely to be cancer. Um, but I always worry about malignancy is really the first thing I think of. Could this be malignancy? And then obviously as a nephrologist, I'm going to think, is it something that has to do with the glomerulonephritis or something up in the kidney? I think a lot of the time you're guided by symptoms, right? If someone says, I, I burn when, it burns when I pee and I've got hematuria, it's easy, right? So if they come with symptoms, that very quickly guides you down a pathway that's going to probably get you to a diagnosis pretty quickly. So most of the time it's asymptomatic and that's the bane of your existence, right? It's not yes. the same, but <laughs> yes. it, it's, the, it's the asymptomatic stuff where it's like, where did this come from? And okay, this patient could have cancer. And how do I get to at least rule that out and, and then move on to the other diagnoses that are maybe less, you know, less concerning than a cancer, although glomerulonephritis is pretty, pretty concerning too. And we were talking a little bit before we started about sort of, I know, I think some of the urology guidelines differentiate between high risk and low risk and high risk, I think being high risk and malignancy. So in the patient's history, what factors are going to make you think, oh gosh, I should really be worried about cancer. I know Obviously, anyone can have malignancy, but what, what risk factors traditionally would confer cancer risk in, in this patient population? Right. So the first thing is if you have gross hematuria and they're clots, it's much more likely urologic, and, and those patients should really get a serious urologic workup for malignancy. But the things, um, you know, older patients, and it depends on how old you are, what old is, but some places say older than 35 is enough to consider high risk. The American Urologic Association, their guideline has different age groups. I think it's sometimes easier just to sort of have one cutoff. Um, I think 35, 40 is probably a, a reasonable cutoff to say above that. I'm, I'm a little more worried about malignancy. Smokers, um, people with certain environmental exposures, paints, dyes. Um, I don't know how prevalent those are, but you can ask. And if someone says, yeah, I do hair dye all the time, maybe they're using <laughs> some some chemical um the uh, aristolochic acid, which is in some herbs, um, very uncommon now, but, but there were some outbreaks of kidney failure from that. That could cause bladder cancer. Um, so I'm going to get some of these exposures. And, you know, certainly if there's gross hematuria, 
that immediately puts you high risk. Um, age older than 35, smoking history, those are the easy ones that are going to take me down the path of I'm going to be have a more aggressive urologic workup if it's not nephrologic. Paul, you looked like you were going to ask something. No, that's just my face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just always lightly confused. Uh, uh, any any physical symptoms? So you mentioned clots being particularly concerning. I feel like we, we traditionally asked about back pain or, or flying pain specifically. Anything, any any other sort of localizing symptoms before we sort of move deeper into our evaluation? Well, if, if we're thinking <clears throat> certainly on the urologic side, anything that might suggest you know pain or obstruction, um, flank pain bladder pain, dysuria, the, the usual symptoms you would think about. You know, if you're thinking about UTIs, kidney stones, you know, cysts that are bleeding in the kidney. Um, when it comes to the diseases I take care of, I'm looking for systemic symptoms. So if I'm thinking things like lupus, vasculitis, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at primary renal type syndromes, thinking the anchor vasculitis, GBM disease. If, if there is, I see my favorite rheumatologist in the room. Uh, you taught me most rheumatology that I know. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'm going to go head to toe. You know, just one of a red eye and pain when they look at the light. I'm thinking UVIs, there's something systemic going on. Do they have a rash? Do they have a malar rash? Ulcers in their mouth, sort of thinking through the lupus type of um, rashes, palpable purpura moving me water vasculitis. So I think a, a good exam is, is going to at least guide you, and then lab testing will guide you. Um, and then, you know, kidney biopsy or not, it's going to be where it's going to go. I wanted to share an anecdote that might set up the next part of this, Paul. So what one uh, we had a sponsor a while back that was like sending us a lot of produce. I don't know if you remember that. And they were sending it was like it was one of those like slightly imperfect foods uh, ones. I don't think I got this. OK. Anyway, well, we should, I, we I probably should have looped you, I probably yeah. looped you in on that one. But uh, they were for some reason they were sending me like bunches and bunches of beets. And I have like this. I was raised like not to waste anything. So I was eating a lot of beets. And it was horrific. Like, beet urea, Paul, <laughs> seems to be a real thing. So I'd like to talk about other things that can cause maybe pseudo-gross hematuria. And uh, thank, sorry about the too much information, everybody. But <laughs> beet urea, I can, can attest, it's a real thing. So, so the first time I saw a case of beet urea was in high school. So I grew up in South Africa, and there's certain rivers you were told, don't swim in those rivers because there could be bilharzia. And we kind of knew that bilharzia can cause blood in the urine, so... One of my high school friends got red urine, and we all thought he had bilharzia. And, <laughs> and he said, no, I just ate too many beets. So that was actually the first time. I and mean, then I have a kid who gets beeturia. So there's something genetic. Not all people will get it. Maybe if you eat a you know, bucket full, you'll get it. Got to be honest. It kind of turned me off to eating beets. <laughs> <laughs> I find it quite colorful. <laughs> and while we're, while we're on the topic of pseudohematuria, because I think this is what we're – we don't have to focus in just on beets, even though they're able to talk about and apparently we're sponsored um, in some way by them. <laughs> <laughs> any, I, and I do have beat, some medications yeah. behind us, but any other any other potential exposures yeah. that you think about? So the um, rifampin would be one. I actually had a lupus patient recently who had a, a, a positive TB test and needed immunosuppression. They put on rifampin and her urine turned red and everyone thought her lupus was out of control. Turned out it was rifampin, sort of more an orangey red color. Um, peridium. I see twice, it's twice yeah, up there, so it must be the most important, important reason. Definitely important. But yeah. I have seen peridium, although I don't know how often people are using. Maybe you guys use peridium, but by a ton. A, a I think patients can buy it over the counter. So a lot of patients will call me and tell me they're already taking it. Am I am I mistaken about that? Yeah. Isn't that what the? I think there's some over the counter for like people that have I UTI. Right. I think it has peridium in it. And they're, they're you know, if someone does have weird colored urine. I'm I'm looking at their drugs because they are various colors. You might see from propofol apparently causes all different colors, but. I would I hope that we know if our patient was doing outpatient propofol. Um, <laughs> I, what about, I, I feel like oftentimes it, hematuria might be minimized in the setting of anticoagulation. So if someone is taking warfarin or a DOAC, is, is, should, we, should we be reassured by that? Should we be alarmed by that? What does that tell us, if anything? No, I, I, th there's no evidence that anticoagulation should cause hematuria. So if you have hematuria and anticoagulation, you have to work it up. And that person might be lucky, actually, because it unmasked something that was early. So they, they should undergo the same workup. Um, you know, unless there's obvious trauma or something that you can attribute the hematuria to, like any other patient, uh, they should be worked up. Yeah, I, I seem to have, Paul, I don't know if you've had this patient in your practice, but I have 
I've had at least like three or four old men that either they said they went on a long like bumpy car ride or a cycle ride and then they came with hematuria or they held it for a really really long time and then they said they had hematuria so I it was hard to even convince them to get a workup because they're like right. oh I think I know why this happened <laughs> I was like, I don't know if that's a thing. Like, I <laughs> so, so exercise induced hematuria is a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it a few times. Um, people go, you know, run a marathon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's smushing the red cells in the foot and then you get hemoglobinuria, um, oh, or if it's shaking the bladder around. Yeah, uh, but but very well described. You know, if someone says to me, "Look, I I just ran a marathon. I have hematuria. I'm first going to check their CK actually." But <laughs> you're right. Um, the other cause of uh, pigment in the in the urine but um I, I would probably not do a ct immediately on a patient like that mm. paul should we go to the next part of the case we should all right so do we have a little bit more history mr jones tells us he's been having intermittent hematuria for about the past two weeks and then it has progressed to be fairly consistent so now he's having it almost all the time he's without dysuria he's not having flank pain there are no fevers or chills to make us think that this might be a cystitis he has no history of kidney stones to his knowledge. He denies new sexual partners. He's been without recent strenuous exercise, so unfortunately no marathons for Mr. Jones. Um, other than some lumbar back pain, which is chronic, and he does say, well, I did have a cold a couple of weeks back. He otherwise feels reasonably well. So we have a little bit more history, maybe not as thorough as we could have taken, um, considering we think about rheumatologic stuff. But does any of this help at all? Does this any of this start to form a differential for you? Not yet. I think I'd need some labs at this point. Um, he did take non-steroidals. Um, if you have chronic long-term non-steroidals, you can get papillary necrosis. He's got some back pain. Um, back pain could be kidney pain. It depends where it is. Um, and, you know, could have a stone, I guess. But bilateral, you know, sort of lower back pain generally, that's not the case. So at this point, I'm thinking I need some more testing. I need to sort of focus it a little um, and, and figure out if I'm actually dealing with something that's something a nephrologist should take care of or not. All right, let's say we do an examination because we are excellent doctors. Uh, he is normotensive in the office. He does not have any obvious rashes or oral lesions. His cardiac exam is not exciting. His lungs are clear to auscultation. No lower extremity edema. You check a point of care urinalysis in the office, and it is indeed cloudy. It is red. Well, we do the point of care urinalysis. There is indeed blood. We can look, see it just looking at it, but the dipstick shows three plus blood, trace protein, no glucose. pH is 6.5. The specific gravity is 1.022. No ketones and your blinogen is 0 0.2 milligrams per deciliter. So one of the, the frameworks that I've heard about thinking about hematuria and what you've alluded to is sort of separating glomerular from non-glomerular causes. So as we, we have this point of care urinalysis, does that change anything for you? And then I guess, where would you go from here? So the problem with the urinalysis is the urine protein is not accurate enough. So trace protein could be 500 milligrams, could be zero, could be two grams. Um, it really depends on the concentration of the urine, which here is 1.022 relatively concentrated on the specific gravity. Um, it's helpful. It's not three plus protein. Certainly if it's three plus, I believe it. If it's zero, it's probably not a lot. But in between, the, the urinalysis isn't accurate enough. So I'm going to need to get a quantification with you know, an albuminuria or proteinuria direct measurement to get me clued in. It's, it's maybe reassuring. I just not very comfortable with the trace protein as a nephrologist. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not yet, yet ready to say this is definitely a urologist's problem. Um, so I think we need a little more information than, than we have just on this urinalysis. But clearly there's, there's, there's blood in here and uh, we need to move to the next, next level. Can you speak to the, the, the difference between the urine protein creatinine ratio and the urine albumin creatinine ratio and the, I guess the reliability of either of those? Do you, because as a first test, do you recommend one or the other? I mean, traditionally, I've said just get a urine protein creatinine ratio. We know the urine albumin is somewhere around 60% of the protein creatinine ratio. Mm -hmm. Albumin is probably a little more sensitive and more accurate. Um, the proteinuria tends to be less accurate, much lower levels. Mm -hmm. um, I think the albuminuria is going to be helpful and it's going to tell you if there's glomerular protein. And so. I think over the years, I've leaned more towards checking albuminuria, although I've, I frequently get both because mm -hmm. I call it the poor man's UPEP. Okay. Right, because <laughs> if, if you've got a big difference between the two, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to tell me there's tubular proteins in here, and I'm sort of going down a different path with that. So I don't think there's a 
for me, I, I often will get both because they'll come back quickly and the UPEP may take a while. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the albuminuria will give you glomerular protein. And nowadays, if you're looking at chronic kidney disease and risk stratification, the albuminuria is a, a much better measure. So I think most nephrologists now, at least chronically, are, are following that lab as well. But generally, you're going to get the same information as a screening test. And mm -hmm. it's going to be better than a dipstick. Okay. And I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the urinalysis. We were actually um, joking before this presentation. I, we typically don't see cast reported, but I feel like there's lots of parts of the urinalysis that I just cheerfully ignore and just hope that they're not actually ever going to become relevant. So things like crystals, um, I, I just, I'd rather just not know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess, could you sort of talk us a little bit through some of the specifics about the urinalysis that might be particularly helpful? So you mentioned, obviously, the protein, the albumin stuff would be very useful, but is are there other things that I should not be ignoring in terms of the urinalysis that might be helpful or help guide our differential yeah. at all? So a couple of points I'll make, and some for the audience here is, so for example, our urinalysis in our lab will report the number of cells per ml, and then it'll report per high power field. If you do the math, they're just dividing the number of cells per ml by about five. I couldn't figure out, it's somewhere between 5.5 and 5.6, and they may be factoring the specific gravity to get you, but no one's actually looking anymore. Um, it, it's just automated. So don't think someone looked at that urine. Now, there may be pl other places that do look, but that takes like a whole two people to, to look at urines all day if you're in a big hospital, and I think that that's very costly. So most of it is just done automated with an automated measure. So you can't trust that someone's ever looked at a urine that you sent to a lab. I don't think LabCorp's got someone sitting in a lab looking at urine, but may maybe they do that someone will like, <laughs> yeah, send well, we'll you guys hear about it. Yeah. It's okay. We'll but, get the, we'll but, get but it's the important hate because it, 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 you think someone's looked and they haven't. And, and I've found in my own experience, the lab will, I've never seen a lab pick up a red cell cast. And so this week I had a patient in the hospital with a, they, they saw granular cast. I thought that was really impressive, except we looked and they were red cell cast. So you can't trust the lab. What, what is helpful is red cells, right? If there are no red cells, you probably don't have a red cell cast and you can move on. If there are red cells, it doesn't really help you unless mm -hmm. you look at it yourself and that's often t difficult for folks. So if you see red cells, just assume there might be casts in there because the lab's not going to pick them up. Yeah, one, once in a while in a urinalysis, I'll see hyaline casts or granular casts reported, maybe occasionally some like calcium oxalate crystals. Yeah. Like Paul said, I, I wish they wouldn't include all that, <laughs> yeah. all that information, yeah. but I, I, much. I do. Yeah. yeah so, so the crystals are nonspecific. You know, everyone is, I don't know, we frequently see a oxalate cast, you know, I mean, sorry, calcium oxalate crystal quite mm -hmm. common. Um, you know, I think you just look at that in the context. If someone had a kidney stone and they have that, well, they probably have calcium oxalate stones, or mm -hmm. at least there's calcium oxalate in the urine. Um, I don't also don't make a lot of the, 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 the crystals. Um, usually we're seeing them when the specific gravity is really high because that's when things precipitate in the urine. So more often than not, they're a clue that this is just very concentrated urine. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that because you probably ordered a protein creatinine ratio at the same time and the creatinine is really high in the urine. So they're, it, it's probably based on that mostly. And high lung cast the exact same thing. They're going to just be uh, telling you that this is concentrated urine. Mm -hmm. Should we give him some more studies here, Paul? We should. I did want to ask, and I, I don't know if you can speak to this at all. I stumbled across the three tube tests in a couple of papers as I was preparing for this, and it's not something I'd ever heard about. Is that anything that we're actually doing in practicality? Urologists might be. This is where you massage the prostate and you get urine before, during, and after. I, I something like that. I, um, <laughs> okay. I, I, is the prostate I massage necessary? I remember, <laughs> being, I, I remember back in med school, which is a long time ago for me, a urologist telling me they don't do them even. This was 30 years ago. So... They probably do still do them, but I would defer to you all. Just Which to... begs the question, what was Paul reading? <laughs> <laughs> just an ancient textbook. Um, all right, so we get some urine micro back from the lab. Zero to five WBCs, RBCs greater than 20, uh, epithelial cells zero to 10, some calciate oxy crystals, of course, um, few bacteria without growth. So based on this information, uh, we'll say Matt decides that Mr. Jones's hematuria is likely non-glomerular and refers the patient to nephrology, or not nephrology, urology. So in your, your experience, recognizing that, you know, nephrology is your world, but since you're an our expert in hematuria, what does the urologic look like in terms of working something like this up? So if we're convinced this is non-glomerular bleeding, we send the patient to urology, where might they go from here and what, what would the guidelines tell us to do? Right. And, and often the, the intern is starting the work up anyway. You know, it doesn't get to urology until you've done some of these studies and, or they show up in my clinic and I say, okay, I, I'm going to do the urologist a favor and 
get the workup done before they see urology. So sort of what is that workup? And I think that does depend somewhat on the risk. Um, so if, if you look at some just a basic, if you want to just keep it simple, I've got risk factors. I'm older than 35. I'm a smoker. Maybe I've got exposures. I'm just gross hematuria. I'm going to start with imaging. Um, and generally, the best test is a CT with contrast, a CT urography. It's going to pick up masses. It's going to pick up tumors. It's going to pick up stones. Sorry, tumors and masses are the same thing. Sorry, cysts, masses, and, and stones. You'll pick those all up. Um, you'll see um, anatomical abnormalities. Um, you'll see things along the, the, the ureters. And if you go down into the pelvis, you may even see masses in the bladder or see bladder wall thickening, things that might clue you in. But the CT is the best study. The urology recommendation would say if it's a low-risk patient, they, so they have this intermediate risk where you would get an, where you could do an ultrasound, and then the low risk, if you want, you get an ultrasound. I'm generally going to get an ultrasound on everybody who's got hematuria if I really don't have a good alternative explanation for that hematuria. And then if that imaging's negative, they're going to need a cystoscopy because uh, bladder cancers are not uncommon, and that's where the money is. Now, I get asked something about you, cytopathology. Um, my view on that is if the cytopathology is positive, they're going to get a cysto. And if it's negative, I'm still going to get a cysto. So, and, and, and it's not in the guidelines either. But the urologist will get cytopathology. And by the time they're seeing the urologist, there's good reasons why they would be doing that. But I'd leave that to their evaluation. Yeah, it's not a test I order. But I at yeah. least the urology groups uh, at Cashlack seem to, to order that test fairly often. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, did you have a slide of, of the workup, an easy-to-read slide? I do, I do. Oh, yeah, I thought so. For reference, this is an up-to-date. I find it very helpful. So if you don't have, um, if you don't absorb this talk, I think you can just sort of look. And basically, I think the important thing here, let me just point. I think there's referral over here somewhere. Um, so that, that's probably the most useful thing. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll So they could to, have simplified so, it to one box. <laughs> If, if you do go up to date, the two biggest boxes in there are the ones that you need to look at. The rest, probably, you can work out yourself. You probably know it already. And, and my role for, on the show and in life has always been sort of ask the really obvious questions. But truly, I, I don't. I'm asking because I'm um, lightly confused. With ultrasonography, what are we looking for specifically? I feel like there's so much stuff that it might potentially miss. Like, what are the things we're, we're potentially going to catch with ultrasonography if we're going to start with that? So the, the easy ones are, are cysts. If the masses are big enough, you'll, you'll see those. You'll see hydronephrosis. Um, if there's obstruction, you'll possibly see a stone. You won't always see the stone because it could be low. Um, you'll see anatomical abnormalities. You'll see if someone has two kidneys. It's, that's a fun one. <laughs> it's a good place to start. It's the other referral, uh, one kidney. Where did that come from? Um, so it, it, it gives you some reason. The, the ultrasound these days have, have good definition of the vascular arterial venous flow um, but the resolution on a CT is, is far greater you're going to pick up the small cancers that you may want to know about now uh, you're going to pick up you know the, the, the cysts that are hemorrhagic versus not and things like that so certainly CT is better imaging and ultrasound is a good screen a low, low risk patient you just want to make sure there's nothing major going on it, it'll get you helpful information and easy to do and no radiation. And without the radiation exposure, right? Is is there a big difference between for you the patient with uh, as, like asymptomatic, like microscopic hematuria and gross hematuria, as far as the, like the, the the urologic, the imaging workup, the cystoscopy? So having gross hematuria immediately puts you in that high risk category. So you're going to get the CT and mm -hmm. the cysto. Um, from a general standpoint, gross hematuria is probably more serious in, in the nephrologic world too because it means more of your, your glomerular capillaries are bleeding. Right, so the question I often ask med students is, how come you can have a patient with hematuria but no proteinuria, right? Like red cells are way bigger than protein. And it's just when you have hematuria, it's actually bleeding. You know, mm -hmm. the, the little capillaries have popped. And so if you see a lot of blood, it means a lot of capillaries have popped. And so it's generally going to signify more serious disease. So yeah, it does. It does up the ante if I'm if I'm seeing gross hematuria. Yeah. So the, the ultimate workup's pretty but much the same. Same workup but, though. Ultimate. But it's just you're you're more heightened. You're more vigilant about the person with gross hematuria and more worried for something more. Yeah, I serious. might make a phone call instead of just <laughs> sending some labs and okay. then Understood. putting it in the computer and waiting six weeks for them to be seen. Yeah. Okay. 
so let's let's say for the for now because we're going to get to the glomerular bleeding, obviously. But um, while we're here in your logic categories, let's say we've done all our due diligence. They've gotten the cystoscopy and they've got imaging and all the stuff comes back stone cold normal for the most part. So no cancers. Shoot, that's good news. But the patient is still peeing blood, which I, I've had. We, I've had cases like this. So where what's some of the more exotic stuff that we would go from here if we if we're still thinking this is non glomerular, but we, we need to figure them out. Why? Why else might they be having gross hematuria? Right. So firstly, there are some nephrologic, like the mild IgA nephropathy, or there's a disease called thin basal membrane disease. You can argue if it's called, if it's a disease or not, but they can present with hematuria without proteinuria. So once you've done all your workup, you circle back to those type of diseases. They generally aren't causing a, well. They they can cause persistent hematuria, but not gross hematuria it, with those diseases. Um, so if, if, if I've got someone who's got recurrent gross hematuria, I've certainly had those sort of patients. What sort of things am I thinking of? Um, papillary necrosis. Um, I might check a sickle screen in, in, in the appropriate patient um, because there's susceptibility there. Um, I might think of vascular abnormalities. So looking at doing angiography, the CT, or an actual angiogram if someone's really got gross hematuria. Um, you know, I've, there are people that we never make a diagnosis diagnosis generally the gross hematuria patients we're figuring it out the, the, the asymptomatic micro hematuria one episode or two episodes probably half the time you you, you never really find anything but with the gross hematuria I'm, I'm probably going to keep looking at for things and, and AVMs and papillary necrosis are going to start showing up on my, my list of, of considerations so if you still don't find anything, I, I think this comes up a, a lot too, the patient with one episode of gross hematuria and you don't find anything on the workup or with asymptomatic hematuria, um, how often do you need to follow it up? Like if it, if it happens again and or if it just doesn't happen again, but they had that one incidence, like how long right. do we have to follow this and worry about it? Right. So the, the AUA guidelines and the low risk patients say you can check it again in a year. I mean, I, I, I like six month intervals because a year later I've forgotten about everything. <laughs> Um, but I would say six to 12 months, you want to check again. And, you know, if, if it is recurrent, then you, you, you sort of move to the more serious workup. Mm -hmm. If it's someone with asymptomatic, you didn't do a big one. Yeah. And so you might follow this just annually um, as far as I saw some, maybe some writing about like, if you did the whole workup and you didn't find anything, maybe three to five years later, you might even do another cystoscopy and another imaging test if they keep having it. I don't I don't think I've had a patient like that. Maybe I'm missing them, but uh, <laughs> that seems like that's not going to be a, a common thing you'd need it, to do. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be very common. And certainly if they've got re recurrent gross hematuria, there's something going on there. Yeah. I think I have one patient with confirmed thin basement membrane disease, and she has persistent microscopic hematuria, and we're... We cheerfully just follow that. She's doing fine. But. Right. So that would be, and, and then the question with those people is, do you biopsy them? And they don't really need biopsies, but sometimes it gives everyone a peace of mind mm -hmm. that you've ruled that out. Yeah. We all sleep better the next day. Right. All right, Paul, what's next? We have more more of a case here? We do. So Oopsie Doodle is literally written in the script here because uh, <laughs> I'm an excellent educator. While our patient uh, is at the urology appointment, the urine protein comes back and the patient has severe albuminuria. So we look at the part of the urinalysis that we usually ignore, and the lab notes erythrocyte casts. So we call the patient, we leave a frantic voicemail as the patient's undergoing cystoscopy saying, hey, I actually think that you should see a nephrologist instead. So Mr. Jones goes to nephrology, completely bewildered, um, someone angry at his primary care doctor. So I might ask, so now, now our patient is squarely in your hands. Now we have a patient who has gross hematuria, but now albuminuria. So we're, we're much more solidly in glomerular bleeding. So what, what might your workup look like and how how might you address this particular patient now that he's landed on your doorstep? So I assume the workup, much of the workup was done earlier. So the most important is what's, is the albumin in the urine and what's my serum creatinine or what's my GFR, right? If, if I've got a creatinine that's going up and I'm not obstructed, I, I'm really worried about a, 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 a renal process, right? Proteinuria is going to clue me in and then systemic symptoms. Hypertension, this patient had hypertension, it was new. Generally, that's not going to have your urologic diseases. Um, and, and those are sort of the big ones that, that are going to sort of very quickly lead me down the nephrology pathway. So you can make both appointments at once. And, but we're really looking at kidney function. If the, if the cranium is going up, and, and then the question is, is there rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, that's going to be obviously a ser the most serious of the, the nephrologic uh, issues. And, and the differential is pretty similar if it's rapidly progressive or not. You still go through the same diseases. It's just 
more likely some than others if it's rapidly progressive. Yeah. So this person, this would be somebody. So if we're the primary care, we have somebody with uh, hypertension, albuminuria, new gross hematuria. We should be very worried and get them to you quickly, especially if the creatinine's rising. Yeah. No, I, I would say that it requires urgent evaluation if the creatinine's rising. Mm -hmm. You know, if they've had hematuria for six months and the creatinine's the same as it was six months earlier, they probably don't need to see me tomorrow. Right. Um, but but certainly these are serious diseases that can. If you don't catch them early, you you lose kidney. So you know, time is kidney. Yeah. And so they they do need a very uh, rapid evaluation. Want to get into the workup for? Yeah. No, I feel like we we could have at least even help if we were um, better doctors. We would we would have done a fairly thorough workup before sending them to you. So I guess I would like you to sort of if you could just talk us through what what reasonable baseline labs you might check in this patient. And I I think some of this might knee-jerk order them because it's an up-to-date, but if you could even sort of talk us through what you're looking for with these things specifically, that would also be really helpful. Right. So, you know, I think the, the, the way to approach it is say, well, what could this patient have? And, and this would really apply to our rapidly progressive GNs or just GNs in general. So, you know, hematuria with proteinuria, I've probably got a, I'm in the glomerulonephritis realm, but, you know, we, we do see hematuria with proteinuria in our sort of nephrotic type of disease as well, which um, are probably going to be assessed somewhat with, with these labs as well. So if I'm thinking glomerulonephritis, I'm, uh, the way that you're going to actually divide them up, that makes it a little bit easier. Otherwise, it just is like a blur. Like, there are all these diseases. I'm going to send these labs, and hopefully I hit it, right? Um, so I think of sort of three big groups, right? The one is the easiest one, anti-GBM. Um, and if it involves the lung, we call it good pastures. If it doesn't involve the lung, it's just kidney. We call it anti-GBM disease. And these diagnoses are all made on immunofluorescence really like when you start putting them in the three categories so i've got my anti-gbm disease i've got my anchor gns or my palsy immune right when you do the immunofluorescence there's not a lot of Im immuno there, there isn't there shouldn't be antibodies there and then we have our immune complex gns right that's your big three families the anti-gbms are usually pretty easy to know because if, if they don't have a rapidly progressive renal failure it's probably not there you can throw that away um anchor gns um Contrary to popular belief, they don't have to be rapidly progressive. We have many patients with you know, anti-MPO antibodies, and they've been around for a year, and they kind of didn't get blown off, but it was like, well, I don't think, I think it's just the bystander, and the creatinine's rising slowly. You do a biopsy, and yeah, there's one crescent, but it's not a fulminant crescentic GN. Um, so we can't rule them out by a non-rapidly progressive disease, and that's why the, the workup seems to be similar for rapid versus non-rapid. Um, but then I've got my anchor GNs, and fairly simply, I'm going to send off anchor antibodies, uh, which is really anti-MPO and anti-PR3 antibodies. Um, and think about if you have both present at the same time, think about drug type of induced anchor GNs. And then my immune complex GNs, which are, that's where you get a whole list. And, and one way then to divide that up is looking at complement levels. And... Um, my low complement versus normal complement disease. And it, it's not that hard to, to remember because when we have hypercomplementinia, they're really just three big families. One is my infection-related GNs, um, one is lupus, and then one is the, sort of this MPGN family, which you see with things like Hep C, you can see with monoclonal There's a whole differential diagnosis for, for MPGN, but that's like the big, the big three. They can have normal complements, so you've always got to include them anyway. And then on the, the normal complement, immune complex, I'm thinking IgA, Enox, Shonline, Purpura. And that's sort of, that's really it for the, you're going to hit it 90% of the time, you're going to get your diagnosis in that group. And then there's a whole lot of mimickers um, of, of an RPG. And so HIV nephropathy can give you a rapid loss of kidney function. Generally, no hematuria, though. So it may not make it to this lecture. Um, hep C related disease is usually on the list. It's an MPGN generally, or cryoglobulins can, can also cause renal failure. The other mimickers would be um, myeloma. You have rapid renal failure. Again, you should not see hematuria, but people with myeloma can. There, there's a whole lot of other diseases for another day that monoclonal gammopathy is associated with. There are 10 different renal diseases. It's not always just the amyloid or the casts. Um, scleroderma can cause, you know, or, or thrombotic microangiopathy um, would also give you rapidly progressive renal failure. And there you're looking at, you know, someone's got a hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, 
So they're those sort of mimicker groups that don't quite fit into my GNs, but can look very similar. So we have to work all those up as well. But so the basic here is the C3, C4 is going to narrow you down to some of those hypercomplementing diseases, post-infectious GN, ANA, anti-double stranded DNA, generally lupus, anchors, um, our vasculitis and drug-induced um, anti-GBM, as I said, clinically, they're usually pretty obvious. Uh, HIV for HIV nephropathy, but HIV can also cause immune complex disease. Hep B, Hep C, Hep B, usually we're getting membranous nephropathy, not usually causing a GN, but it can. Our SPEP and free light chains is, you know, looking for monoclonal gammopathies um, and the various diseases that can be related. So that's sort of knowing what you're looking for makes it a lot easier for me to understand why I'm getting those those particular tests. So sorry, long that's answer. A, that's a really nice way to break it yeah. down. I, I like that a lot. I feel like, I don't know about you, Matt, you don't have to admit this, but I will just because I'm, I'm used to humiliating myself on the show. But like, I feel like compliments fall solidly in the same realm as crystals, where it's one of those things where like I fire it off. I'm like, I, I hope that comes back normal. <laughs> um, so, But now I actually have a framework, so that's really helpful. <laughs> Yeah, this I I think I learned that I think I learned this kind of stuff for step one, and then like immediately <laughs> forgot it. I'll never have to worry about that again. So yeah. just just keep in mind, normal complement, you can still see all these diseases. So mm-hmm. for example, in post-infectious, only seventy-five percent of folks have low complement. Lupus depends. You know, membranous lupus is fifty percent, and proliferative is ninety percent low complement. So negative doesn't rule it out. Mm-hmm. Positive is really helpful. This is yeah. going to take you down a different pathway. It sounds like we're going to need your help regardless once we get to this point. But uh, it's nice to know, have some sense of what's going on. I think it inspires confidence in the patient when they, you know, <laughs> when you have some at least passing familiarity t- with what what's, what what is happening to them and the workup that's happening. So thank you for that. That's good. You're gonna make you're gonna make Paul and I look like <laughs> competent primary care doctors and the audience as well. Uh, Paul, what's what's next? I, I, at some point, we might have time for audience questions, but I, I think for sure we're in the home stretch. I would like it's probably easier to ask at this point. So, a patient who's presenting to you um, with glomerular bleeding, is there what would be the instances where you wouldn't get a biopsy? I guess like where where would you be so reassured that I don't have to I, I don't need tissue for the diagnosis? I think if there's very little proteinuria and they have stable disease, and we know that they've had hematuria for a long time, so that would make me think something like thin base membrane or or it's a very low level IgA. Um, you know, there, there are debates if you, you know, what do you do in someone who they've got pulmonary involvement, they've got anchor titus through the roof, and they've got renal failure. Do you biopsy those folks? You know, that gets a little bit, there are a lot of people who won't. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in put a needle in it. <laughs> <laughs> but for many reasons, not only diagnostic confirmation, but you know, what, what happens is you don't do it, and then two months later, they're not getting better, and you're like, oh, now I've got to get a biopsy, and we don't know what we started with. And that's going to make a huge difference into what you may do next. Um, you know, and so generally, I'm getting a biopsy for most of these processes, um, trying to figure out what's going on. But there are, you know, there are times when you, you don't. Obviously, a patient doesn't want it. You're not going to do it. And if they have high risk of, of bleeding, um, and there are patients where, you know, you, you about to do a biopsy and they say, hey, you know, did I tell you about that hematoma I had spontaneously in my psoas muscle last week? And I say, no, you didn't, but maybe you should go back to your room and not get a kidney biopsy. So there are obviously times when you're not going to do a biopsy. It's just too risky. In general, the risk is low. I'm, I'm telling my patients, you've got a one in a hundred chance, less than one in a hundred of needing an admission if it's an outpatient procedure and you, things you get admitted for would be an angiogram because the bleeding hasn't stopped, um, blood transfusion, or hemodynamic instability, and these are pretty uncommon, and um, but real risk, benefit, you know, is huge much of the time. So it, it's usually a pretty easy decision, but there there are some times when you're not going to do a biopsy. The last question I have for you, and I, and I don't know that we have to spend a whole ton of time on this, is I, I feel like I, in my reading I've seen that patients with renal transplants and hematuria is kind of fall into a different category. I can tell you as a primary care doctor, if I have a patient with renal transplant hematuria, like it's they're just going to nephrology too sweet. Like that workup's easy for me. But for you, does that change the way you think about things, or what? What do you worry about differently for for a patient who might be transplanted? It, sometimes it does depend what their baseline disease was. So some diseases recur. So I'm going to be thinking about that. Rejection will be on my list. So that is something that's serious. So. You, um, Unusual infections, so like BK virus, although those are usually associated with rising creatinines as well. 
So I don't do a lot of transplant. My, my go-to, the transplant biopsies are much less dangerous because the kidney's right there and you can <laughs> put your finger <laughs> on the bleed. <laughs> um, so much lower threshold to put a needle in it. Although nowadays the transplant guys are sending off these DNA, free DNA things. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite there yet. I, I like putting <laughs> needles in things. We'll wrap up the case. So Mr. Jones ultimately undergoes renal biopsy. He is diagnosed with lupus nephritis, shockingly. He now follows with nephrology and rheumatology. He hails you as a diagnostic wizard. So happy ending sort of uh, for Mr. Jones. So we'll end there for our particular case. And I guess I, if maybe before questions, why don't we ask you, um, Derek, any, any major take-home points that you'd like our, our internists out there to, to take away from this talk, like the really big picture stuff that you'd like them to bring home? Yeah, I, I think the big picture is think urology and cancer to start. Do a, a very quick, very easy to decide whether you need a nephrologist involved. Albuminuria, look at the cranium. Those are normal. You're probably okay for now. Um, and, and go on the urologic realm. Gross hematuria, you know, always take that seriously. And as you guys probably say in your podcast, I, uh, I was going to say I haven't listened to it a whole lot, but... Um, <laughs> How dare you? Why would you? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, do a good history, right? Like, it's, it's going to get you like 80% of the way just uh, talking to the patient. So... I, I didn't really talk about that, but that is it's probably that's more, been more said than on the physical. show before. Yeah, yeah I'm it, sure it has. And been, Paul and I have been disappointed that you actually have to talk to your patient. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think talking to your theme. patient and doing a history is probably going to get you a whole lot further than in physical. Because yeah. chances are, the thing you find on physical, they're going to tell you it's there, right? Yeah. Like oh, I've got this funny purple thing on my leg that doesn't blanch. Yeah. You know, and then you say, "Are you, me <laughs> are you medical? <laughs> like, why do you think that? Well, you use the word doesn't blanch. I, yeah. you know. It would no, no, something to do my, my husband's a nurse or something. <laughs> you know that sort of thing. And but you know, most of the time, the history is going to get you most of the information. Uh, any any questions? Yes. Okay. So the question is, you get a disconnect between the the urine dipstick and the urine microscopy, and and, and do you have to? further investigate that yeah i think you need to assume that they have hematuria because the urine could have been sitting around in you know in that little box outside the office for three hours and the red cells just exploded and the hemoglobin's still there but the red cells aren't so i would say you got to assume until proven otherwise that there are red cells maybe try get a fresher sample and see if they're red cells and then think about myoglobin you know could is this someone who just exercised you know do they have some myopathy or something but I think you have to just assume that hematuria on a dipstick is, is, is or heme pigment on a dipstick is hematuria. So you, you would repeat it a minimum? I would repeat it, yes. Okay, good question. Any other? Yes. yes. Good question. So it's if someone has lived uh, outside the, the U.S. where we're recording this, anything else that should be high on your list? I mentioned bilharzia earlier, so schistosomiasis <laughs> would be uh, something that, and you know, I, I don't know where it's endemic, but in, I know in Africa, certainly North Africa, Southern Africa, but not not the Vol River, and that, which is just outside Johannesburg. You can swim in that one. <laughs> um, at least they told me that. And I, my, I haven't got bladder cancer, so I think I was okay. Um, obviously, if you see a acute onset of of Dark urine, there's uh, plasmodium falciparum and massive hemolysis would be something. And we've actually had a case or two here over the years at, ho at this hospital with someone traveled. Um, to be honest, not a lot else comes to mind from a re TB. Yeah. Now, you know, we always hear about TB and if you get white cells in the urine, check a TB. I, I think people with TB with white cells in the urine are usually pretty sick. You know, if, if they're like asymptomatic, they probably don't have TB causing pyuria or hematuria. But yeah, I guess that that is on the differential diagnosis. It might even be on that slide that's got a thousand different <laughs> ones on it. On <laughs> okay. Oh, so the question is, if if we don't see anything and the workup's negative, but we think maybe a small stone is passed, how do we handle that situation? Uh, you know, if you've done your workup and you don't find anything, they, they, they probably, you know, isn't something serious going on or something that's going to be life-threatening, at least in the near future. Um, I think that's as good an explanation as any other. It makes you feel better. It makes the patient feel better that, okay, I've at least got some, you know, I'll say these are the things that could do this. And then you move on and then you just keep an eye on them and put it on your past medical history at the top, that hematuria that wasn't well described and wasn't there was no underlying diagnosis and then keep an eye on it. And if it comes back, that maybe something will 
present later. If it's something bad, you'll know it'll come back. Um, but I, that certainly does happen. People can have asymptomatic kidney stones um, that cause hematuria or asymptomatic you know, trauma. And I don't mean to call you out, but your look of existential pain at that question made me feel better as a primary <laughs> care doctor. You had the exact same feeling. <laughs> uh, one last question. Yeah, very, very good question. That's a great question. Uh, for the person who's been exposed to a Foley catheter recently, how long can we blame the hematuria on that? The Foley's out now. If so I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'd say if a month later they still have it, then you worry about it. So okay. when they discharge, have them follow up and get, get a check in four weeks and... If it's still there, it's probably something you need to work up. All right. Well, great. Thank you, audience, for such great questions. Uh, maybe a round of applause for our fantastic expert. <laughs> and uh, I'll ask Paul uh, if you if all would sit for 30 seconds through an outro. Paul, you want to get us to it? Sure. That's the most humiliating part. <laughs> um, this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Y yummy. Did someone in the audience try to say it, too? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's catching on, Paul. <laughs> Hungry for more? Join our Patreon. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Get all our episodes at free plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, our Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And uh, you can find the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can send your comments and feedback to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, America's primary care physician, uh, for writing and producing this episode. And uh, to our whole team, our, our technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris the Chu Manchu is the moderator on our Discord. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you so much. Thank you.